This is episode number 73, featuring artist Frank La Lumia. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we dive deeply into the world of outdoor painting, often called Plen Air painting. For those of you who don't know, Plen Air is a French term essentially meaning open air or outdoors. The French say Plen Air. Others say plain air, but it doesn't matter how you say it, really. It's a huge movement of artists around the world going outdoors to paint. This show is about that movement. And this podcast is brought to you by Plein Air Magazine's Publishers Invitational. It's summer camp for artists in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York, which is one of the best-kept secrets. It's unbelievably beautiful. My muse, absolutely. You'll come for a week of painting and leave with a collection of about 15 or more paintings that you've done in some of the most stunning scenery in America. You will have made lots of new friends, painted with some incredible painters, and have a great lifetime memory. And all levels are invited, beginners to pros. We all paint together. We all hang out together. You could be painting next to somebody famous, but we're all equals at this event, so there's no invitation required. And it's kind of a roll out of bed and everything's covered for you. All your meals and room, just roll out of bed, paint two, three, four paintings a day. Uh, We're all out painting together. It's a lot of fun. You can learn more at publishersinvitational.com. It's coming up in June and we've got some seats left, but you're going to need to jump on that if you're at all interested. Check it out, publishersinvitational.com. Well, it's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting. It's a lot of fun. You can fall in love pretty easily. You can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media or email. Send them the link, and I hope you'll subscribe so it comes to you every week. You can do that on iTunes, of course, and we'd love for you to leave a comment, give us a rating, etc. And if you have feedback for me, please contact me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Well, this interview is also brought to you by the Plen Air Convention. If you're listening to this on time, Plein Air Convention is this week. Wow, I, you know, it's, it's like it just like the year passes so quickly. It's like it's over and then boom, the next one's here. Uh, April 16th through 20th in Santa Fe this week. I've got over, I think, 83 top artists going to be teaching and working with you. They're going to be out in the field working with you. We're going to make history the largest number of people Plein air painting together in one place simultaneously ever in history. This is Plein Air Mecca, a place to come and become part of the tribe, the community. Uh, we're going to have, we think, about 1,100 people. Uh, so it's amazing. We have 400 new people. We've got people who have never painted in their lives, people just showing up and buying their equipment on location in the incredible expo hall people who um, just want to learn about plein air painting. Maybe they've been studio painters, but they've never plein air painted. Uh, We've got a pre-convention workshop the day before. It's optional. It costs a little extra money, but it's a great thing. If you want to learn A to Z, like all about the easels, all about the different mediums, how to use them, techniques, demonstrations, there's a full day of that. There's also a pre-convention workshop with the amazing Kevin McPherson. That's actually two days, day and a half, I guess. And so all that's going on. You can find more at plenairconvention.com. I have no idea if there are going to be any seats left or not. We do have the expo hall open to the public, and we have the art show open to the public. And if there are any last-minute cancellations, then maybe those seats will be available. You can uh, show up at the door and see if you can get in uh, and get a ticket, of course. Well, let's get right to our interview with the amazing Frank Lalumia. Well, Frank... Welcome to the show today. I'm honored to have you on. Well, thanks for inviting me. I was trying to remember when you and I first met, and I think it had to be at a Plinter Painters of America event, and I'm thinking maybe it was in Lake Tahoe. I think think it was. Yeah, I think it was in Tahoe. Yeah, I think that's when I really discovered your work and uh, been 
totally impressed and following you ever since. It's been that's probably been well, we hadn't started Plein Air magazine yet, so that's been well over fifteen right. years ago. Yeah, I think it was in oh four maybe or oh three. Yeah, could be. So, Frank, uh, for those who don't know, because there are a lot of people out here listening who are new to plein air painting, uh, could you describe yourself as a painter? Uh, yeah, good. that's a good question. Uh, I would say that my work is, uh, is what it is because of two uh, distinct factors. Uh, first of all, it's my experience as a plein air painter. And second of all, it's the uh, fact that I work in both oil and water and watercolor. I think those two things have, have combined to make the work uh, what it is, and uh, that, that's how I would uh, describe it. So what, what does that do for you in terms of um, um, confusion factor? I, you know, from my perspective, it's hard enough to master one medium, and it looks like you've mastered two. Can you talk a little bit about why you do that and why you decided to use two different mediums? Well, I started out painting in watercolor back in 1971, uh-huh. and I, and I, about three or four years later, I just added oil painting. I was just around great oil paintings, and it, it was so magical to uh, seeing them and then working in the medium. So now, after after all these years, I couldn't possibly think of not doing one or the other. They're just both, uh, both really a part of me. So as you, far as the, oh, go ahead. Uh, as far as the um, difficulty of doing two, you know, the confusion factor and all that, it's, uh, I think that stuff is, is a little overblown when, uh, after you've had experience in working, in working in both, that uh, it's really that what's similar is much stronger than what's different. You know, you, no matter what medium it is, you have, to, you have to handle your design problems, your color, uh, harmony, your, uh, you know, the whole, you could go down the checklist. Um, the only thing that's a little, I, would, I wouldn't say tricky, but it's, it's concerning is that in plein air with watercolor, you, it, um, watercolor, there's a wild card in the deck, and that is the relative humidity. Like when you're painting, there's a huge difference between painting plein air in the southwest versus uh, painting in the Oregon coast, for example. And it's that, that difference in the humidity, the, the drying time, uh, that's the one thing that... Uh, is the joker in the deck that you have to really be careful about. Uh, other than that, the similarity to me has taken over a long time ago. Well, I'm, I, I don't do much watercolor. I started out in watercolor like you, but I, I quickly abandoned it because I found it to be very difficult. I found that oil color is um, a little bit more forgiving, but also uh, I'm not very well organized, and I think in terms of watercolor, you almost have to work backwards right you have to anticipate what you're going to leave white uh instead right. of adding white etc right like watercolor would be a light to dark medium oil is a dark to light i mean right. there's, that, that's the big you know the uh, differences uh, right there but uh with with watercolor it's hard to explain the magic of watercolor to somebody that doesn't paint watercolors i mean there's magic in oil painting too but there's just something about watercolor that's really amazing to me so if you go out on a trip um maybe maybe you're traveling somewhere do you choose which medium you're going to take or do you take them both with you uh well that would depend if i if i had my van i I just load up anything i felt like if i was going to go on an international trip of some you know months uh, i almost always use watercolor what like would they the, the years that I did the, a lot of traveling through uh, China, Tibet, India, Europe, I uh, I always carried my watercolors. It's just so much easier, so uh, so much lighter. Uh, it just travels a lot easier. And then when you make a sketch uh, in watercolor or oil, are you then turning those sketches into larger scale paintings? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I'm still doing it. I'm sometimes I'll pick up a sketchbook from the 80s and uh, I'll use it for something that will uh, tweak my uh, interest. And will you make an oil painting from a watercolor sketch? Yeah, definitely both. In fact, I really like doing that. I like doing a uh, oil from a watercolor or a watercolor from an oil 
it uh, it kind of keeps you it keeps you away from the impulse to just copy something stroke for stroke. You know, if you do an oil from another oil, there's always a tendency to become a little bogged down in the uh, you know the um, stroke the technical aspect of it. So when you do an oil from a watercolor or vice versa, that just takes care of that right out of the right out of the box. Well, I um, I have here in front of me your book. Um, which is a beautiful inscription that you gave me. I don't know when you gave this to me, but a long time ago, I'm sure. Um, your book is called Plein Air Painting in Watercolor and Oil, Paint from Life Successfully. How, how long has this book been out? It's been out quite a while. Yeah, it's, yeah it was published in, um, I think it was published in 2000, maybe, or 99 or 2000. And it's still so, available? Uh, it's out of print. There, are, You can still get copies on the Internet. Uh, I still have a eBay. few. Yeah, eBay or Amazon, you can usually get some. I still have some copies, too, that uh, in my classes I usually bring a few. Everybody probably has it by now, but but they're, they're, out, they're still out there on a limited basis. Yeah, that's a great book, and it really breaks things down into the basics. What, what do you find typically when you're doing classes? Um, do you find that the people who are attending your classes are uh, more advanced, intermediate, beginner, or is it all of the above? I get kind of a, I would say I get a mixture of all of the above. Plus, not only that, but I'll get oil painters in my watercolor class and watercolorists in my oil painting classes frequently. So what would your best pitch be to an oil painter as why they need to consider watercolor? You know, <laughs> that's, that's a good question, Eric. Um, there's probably no amount of words that can get it across unless you've really experienced that magic. I mean, you, I could talk about the spontaneity and the drying, quick drying time and all that, but in, until the magic really uh, flows through you, it's hard, to, uh, it's hard to really describe or bring somebody around. I don't know if you know this or not, but we launched a new newsletter. Uh, Kelly Kane, who came on board as our editor as Steve Doherty retired, Kelly was the editor of the um, uh, Watercolor um, artist magazine over at F and W, uh, and so when we hired her to replace Steve for Plein Air Magazine, we also launched a new newsletter, online newsletter called American Watercolor. So if you haven't seen that, you should check that out. And uh, we of course should talk to her about getting an article from you in there if she hasn't done that already. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so what what I was going to ask you about in terms of the the principles of of painting is when you get a mixture of, of students at all levels and they're coming to your workshops, you're doing watercolor and, and oil workshops separately. Um, what are the things that they have in common that are the, the things that most painters need to be paying closer attention to, uh, things that you commonly see as errors that painters might be making? Uh, that, that's a good question. In, in my classes, like I, when I get oil painters in a watercolor class and vice versa, uh, to me that is fits seamlessly. There's the, what my, my teaching is not so much dependent on the uh, how to do like small ter- small stuff. It's more I, I try to focus on the uh, big picture of it all. Like in order to be successful as a painter, you have to go from a literal consciousness to a uh, to a larger uh, larger picture picture that takes takes into into uh, account everything uh, for example um, when a person starts out painting be it watercolor or oil it doesn't matter the first thing they'll do is they'll start painting stuff they'll paint a tree they'll paint a river a cloud a foreground and uh, what, what and that's the starting point for everybody however what happens is with experience you you start when you with experience like a tree is no longer a tree like in the beginning you painted a tree but now you're painting a uh, a particular shape of a particular color with a with a particular relationship to the other parts of the painting so w- when you begin to see that it shifts over you go from painting stuff to uh painting these these more complicated relationships so in the class that's what i try to do in my classes i try to bring the, the students along into that space is so where where they go from painting stuff into into understanding the big picture, and that that's why it's so seamless with watercolors and oil painters, 
in, I may only demo in one. I may only, if it's a watercolor class, I'll demo in watercolor and vice versa with the oil. But uh, it's really, it's focusing on really the more important things than the technique itself of handling the paint. Well, I, I think that's interesting because it, I found throughout my my painting career that it's hard to overcome these things that we put into our heads when we were coloring when we were children, you know, lollipop shaped trees and, um, you know, Coloring lines. yeah, perfect sticks. And, and, right. you, you know, it, I've been painting for 20 years and I still find myself doing that sometimes. How do you overcome it? You have to be, you have to be, your consciousness has to shift gears. You have to kind of downshift or maybe it's upshift. I don't know. But you have to go from seeing things, seeing the world as made up of things, to seeing the world as a painting. Like when you look at a tree in the real, like in your painting session, it's no longer a tree. It's like all it is is a piece of color and value, with relationships to the other colors and values in the painting. And it's like if you, it's it's not enough to understand that concept or agree with. You could glimpse that state once in a while, but a painter has to be anchored there like 24/7. You have to be there at all times. Do you, you find you, yourself? You're free. In, do you find yourself envisioning what the actual finished painting is going to look like before you begin? I don't do it as an exercise, but so, yeah, that that happens. But I don't, I don't, I don't like uh, use it as a bullet point, you know, in teaching. But that that's what inevitably happens because you're not when you like for eighty percent of your ninety percent of your painting, you're not really that concerned about the. Uh, the details, you know, uh, of of a scene. You you just try. You're adjusting. You're, uh, t- you know, looking for the relationships, seeing like what's what's darker, what's lighter, what's warmer, what's cooler. And so it's like a, it's kind of a, when you begin to cross reference like that, you you've left the world of stuff, and you're in the in the world that a painter needs to needs to operate from at all times. When uh, you first started painting. Uh, or when any of us first started painting, we go through this struggle of learning these things that you just described. Um, we oftentimes will say to ourselves, gee, if I only knew today, if I knew what I knew today when I was you know, younger or just starting out, I would do things differently. What if you, if you uh, were starting painting today knowing what you know now, uh, what would you do differently? What is the advice you would give somebody who's early stage in their painting career what specific things would you um, suggest? Well, I would work on the, uh, first of all, I would work on what we, what we just talked about is begin trying to see the world as, as color uh, values, uh, shapes with, with the relationships among other things. And then in addition to somebody starting out, I would, uh, I would recommend uh, studying drawing, studying design. Those are things that you can do it. You do it somewhat when you're on, on site, but you can also also do it through uh, looking at artwork of like getting a good design book. Uh, so I would do that. I would say to uh, you know you study what you can on your own, but get out there and paint. That's the main thing. Uh, paint from life, and uh, when you're painting from life, look for the uh, look for the big picture. I wish I could have taken the class I teach today when I was 21 years old. Well, everybody listening, maybe you should you, sh- you should sign up for Frank's class. Um, that would be helpful. You talk about the three S's of plein air painting in your book. I don't mean to put you on the spot because I didn't prepare you for that question, but can you tell me what they are? Uh, simplify it, state it, see it, simplify it, state it. You got it. That's right. <laughs> the pop quiz. And we didn't talk about that either. That, yeah, that that's good advice. I mean, seeing it is what we're talking about with the color and value relationships, you know, among the pieces of the painting. It's like it's like downshifting into that artist world as opposed to seeing stuff. Then uh, simplify it is obvious. I mean, you, Mother Nature throws you know a million values and colors at you, and it's up to the artist to edit it as well as uh, as well as the paint it. And then to state it is that that's like. I got that from Millard Sheets. He was one of my mentors when I was a young man. And Millard, go, he'd go around the room 
and he'd, and he'd see, see somebody with a brush, and they'd be like kind of licking the painting with their brush, you know, stroking it, stroke after stroke. And he, Miller would come by, and he said, no, 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 state it. He, he said the time for searching is, uh, is, is in the observation stage. But when, it come, when the brush hits the canvas or the paper, then you need to state it. And just it's like whatever you can do today, it will be better tomorrow. But it doesn't do you any good to lick the canvas with your with your brush. So I, I always remembered that. So with, the, with the, um, somebody, I think it's Deborah Hughes, talks about uh, lay it down and leave it alone. In other words, yeah. make a stroke and don't touch it. Is that what you mean by state it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say I wouldn't say don't touch it because uh, it's hard to get through a whole painting without <laughs> touching strokes that are like exactly perfect. But uh, yeah, it's the same idea. Exactly. What happens is like we end up like just licking the painting to death and it just beats the life out of it. I mean, you might have started with a painting at 60, six, let's say 60% accurate, but it's still a nice painting. But if you start messing around with it, you're going to get, you're still going to be at the same level and it's going to be overworked, tired looking. Uh, it's like it looks exhausted, which is exactly what the painter did to re- get to that point. How do you know when you're at that point? How do you know when you you say, okay, it's time to just put the brush down and walk away? Good question. There's there's te- there's uh, sometimes it's it's a uh, feel just a feeling. Sometimes it's a technical thing where the light has changed. You've worked on a, pl- a piece for maybe over two hours in the same spot, and they relate now. The relationships are totally different than they were when you started. So really, you're kind of chasing your tail at that point. So that's a good time to even if your painting's incomplete, that's a good time to stop and bring it home with you and recess. Um, and then sometimes, you know, when, when a painting's going well, you just have to, you just have to know that, you know, that it's looking better than, than it's going to look if you keep uh, whacking away at it. So it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of both. So do you take breaks when you're painting? Do you sometimes just walk away, take a little walk or something just to give yourself a fresh perspective? When I'm in my studio, I do. Yeah. All you could, I, I find that I can only, like peak concentration is it's hard to it's hard to to uh, keep it for more than a half hour. I mean, I can paint three four hours, but I mean to be just a hundred percent there. Sometimes I'll just take a five minute break. Uh, when I'm out in on the in the field, I'd never do that. However, you don't have that luxury with the ch- with the light changing. And and, and um, when when you paint in studio, are you painting into more detail, uh, more? F- "Quote unquote finished work." Are you trying to maintain the same energy levels of a plein air study? Uh, usually, um, my studio work. I'll I'll start off as if it was a plein air painting. I'll do a thumbnail sketch, a black and white sketch. Uh, I'll design it in a sketchbook, and uh, and then when, and then I'll I'll begin the painting. I'll try to handle it in a more with, with a kind of a plein air attitude. However, it's almost inevitable in the studio to get you know you get. Uh, because you have time to to finish something, you do, or I, I do, I should say. So my, my studio work tends to start off with the plein air attitude, and hopefully in the end retains a lot of that. But it'll also it also takes on a, a little bit of a studio cast as well. Uh, you talked about early on. You talked about the importance of plein air painting. Can you, um, for those people who are listening, who who are just kind of again trying to get the drift of it and understand, can you? Can you articulate what changed when you went out plein air painting for the first time? I know in your book you said you didn't you didn't even know it was called plein air painting when you first started doing it. Right. You know that that's a good question. Eric. That was my first impulse. Like even before I had a teacher, I just it just seemed I never really thought it out. I mean, I didn't have a logic. I didn't have a uh, reason for doing it. I was just out there doing it, and it, it was like instinctive. It just seemed like if you wanted to paint something. You, should look at it, you know, or see it. So it kind of began that way. And uh, in my first teachers, I, I started off in watercolor. They weren't really, uh, they were out there painting outside, but they weren't that plein air oriented in the sense of bringing home a true observation, you know, of, of a moment in time of a particular light effect. So it just kind of, it just started, uh, I don't know, it just uh, seemed like the right thing to do. It's hard to describe it. 
in your book, you have a actually the photo that's on the cover, the painting that's on the cover is a beautiful barn with a mountain and a very dark sky in the background. And in the book where you give the example of doing that painting, you're actually starting out with uh, two photographs, one of a dark sky with some cool clouds, the other is of this building. And the building, though it's in light, doesn't look at, uh, a lot like the painting. So can you talk about painting from photographs and how you take that photograph then and turn it into the, um, the enhanced, uh, the painting so that you're not doing just a photographic representation? Uh, yeah, on that, on that particular painting, that, um, that, that's a scene in uh, Trinidad, Colorado, where I live. And I, I wasn't living there at the time, but I had bought my property and I was planning on moving there. So, so I felt connected to the area so it was kind of a collection of things, like the the old church was one element, the mountain, the flat top Mesa mountain, is kind of the uh, sort of the uh, the um, like a signature of Trinidad when it kind of dominates the whole town. And then the dark, uh, you know, the dark sky was a way of uh, adding a little drama to it all, you know, putting a light burst in there, cutting it through the middle of it, and uh, so it was kind of a, just constructing the painting around a. Uh, around an idea rather than just an observation. And you, you actually, when you did your preliminary sketch of this, uh, you changed the foreground considerably. Um, and then, of course, what you painted in the foreground, it, you either made it up or did it from a study, a plein air study. But um, I, I think the lesson in that is um, you don't have to paint exactly what you see. Right. Even when I use a, a study, like if I have an 8x10 oil and I use it as a study for a larger painting, I'll rarely, I, I will rarely just try to copy it. I'll always add something to it, um, you know, change things around and try to make it the way it feels today as opposed to just, you know, make it a bigger version of a successful study. Okay. Uh, talk to us a little bit about design. You said that uh, it's very important to learn design principles, read a good book on design. Um, I assume when you're talking design, you're talking compositional design. And do you have a book or anything that you would recommend in terms of study? Uh, I do. My my uh, every artist has their own like design bible. It's interesting. It's a great question. The the, the design book that I found in uh, years ago was the uh, called The Art of Color and Design by Maitland Graves. It's M A I T L A N D Maitland Graves, G R A V E S, and it's an old book. It's not, it was it was probably it's in the 20s, and it's been out of print for probably close to 100 years at this point. But you can still find, I found my copy on the Internet. And it's an odd little book. It's kind of a neat, it's an odd size. It's not, it's not smaller than an 8.5 by 11, bigger than another book. A lot of it's in black and white because it's so old. But he just had a way, to me, that book spoke to me in a way that uh, a lot of the other design, design books didn't. I mean, there's tons of great, Excellent design books, but man, some of them, if you can't sleep, just pick up a design book. <laughs> They'll put you out like a light. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, even though there's good information in them, you know, you have to get one that kind of speaks to you on a practical well, so, level. So can you talk about a, a, a few principles of design? And it's I know it's hard to do this without video and not being able to show it. But for instance, you know, one of the great sins we... I don't know. There's probably no right or wrong, but things that seem to work better. Um, one of the things that we're all taught as children that we have to overcome is, you know, you put that horizon line dead center in the canvas, and then you put your focal point dead center in the canvas on that horizon line, which uh, is what a lot of photographers tend to do, too. Um, do you have a particular formula that you try to follow um, the rule of thirds or the quarters or the golden mean or any anything of that nature? You know, what I try to do, that's an excellent question. Uh, what I try to do is I try to remember the uh, the principle of dominance. In, in, it's, a design, it's a design term. And basically, like when you have a landscape and you cut the horizon, like right in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, canvas, what you've got, you've got two shapes that are the same size, basically, and that's why it looks boring. Whereas the idea of dominance, like one, one of those shapes should be bigger, like you could have a big sky and a smaller foreground, or perhaps a thin band of sky and 
or vice versa. So it's like one one thing has to be dominant, uh, otherwise, otherwise you end up with like a two two things that are exactly the same. And it, it's the same with color. Like you wouldn't want to have half your painting green and half your painting uh, red because you're painting a brick farm or something. So like the the idea of dominance is that there's within within the uh, within the contrast you find one you have to have the idea of dominance to re- it resolves the uh, dilemma of two shapes are the same size. You know, half the painting is one color, half it's another. So uh, it's that idea of dominance when you're working that if you keep that in mind, it kind of, it'll steer you away from making uh, a lot of the big mistakes that are so common. Well, I think that that was worth the podcast alone. I think a lot of people will get a lot out of that. Um, talk to me about color because color and color harmony and color temperature are really things that, a lot of painters just don't seem to get. Is there right. a way to simplify understanding of that concept? Uh, yeah, there is. I mean, um, well, you, you know, the, the different artists teach color in different ways. Like one of the, I, I took a class with, um, uh, I can't think of the name, but anyway, the, the, making the uh, color charts is, uh, is one of the things that, some artists push, you know, you'll start with a couple, you, like I say, a palette of eight or nine colors, and then you'll make all the combinations of uh, ultramarine blue and ye- lemon yellow and blah, 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 you know. And then you have these charts to, to refer to and stuff. To me, so that's one way of teaching color. But I found when I was a student, that didn't work with me. I'm, I was too, I don't know, I just wanted to get going. I didn't want to call it, paint little boxes all day. So be, the way I teach color is I teach color in a, 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 a more intuitive way. And basically, my um, the way I teach color is based on the metaphor of a uh, of a of a rainbow of, a, of refracted light being the uh, nature's palette. Like when you see a refra- when you see a rainbow, and you see light refracted, like you see the you see the color, the uh, prismatic colors. You don't see the yellow ochre or burnt sienna in the rainbow. And whereas in reality, yellow ochre and burnt sienna are contained within the colors, within the uh, prismatic colors. So basically, to, to start at that point and, uh, and use that as like a metaphor to continue, like the, uh, that's nature's palette, a rainbow. So basically, so when you start your, when you think about color, understanding it, you can, ma- you can make that leap, you know, uh, easily. And like basically, what happens when you study color in that manner, as opposed to so, you suppose to like making little boxes, is that what you want to do is you want to learn how to intuit color. Uh, for example, when you see a juniper tree, like into if you do if you understand how the colors mix to the colors of the rainbow mix together to make every other color, then when you look at your juniper tree in time and with practice. You'll see uh, cadmium red light as clear as you see the hand in your own in your face, in front of your face. So what you do is you teach yourself to to intuit the color that's within the uh, colors that we see. Like you, if you try to paint a green tree with gr- viridian or halo green, it looks hideous. Even and yet the tree is green. So what's what colors are in that in that uh, tree to make it, you know, uh, look like our pigments? So basically, you go back to the rainbow. You end up adding the other colors of the rainbow into it, it which brings it more in a uh, in a feeling of sunlight. So basically, it's my, the way I teach colors based on the metaphor that uh, that refracted light is nature's palette. And, uh, and as artists, what we're doing is we're trying to do the same thing. So how, own, how many colors are on your typical palette? I use uh, two yellows, two reds, and two blues. So you're using a warm of each and a cool of each, right? Warm and right, warm and a cool of each. And so uh, frequently I'll substitute colors, but I rarely will add two. I rarely use more than six. Sometimes I'll I'll change out cerulean for halo blue, or or change out alizarin for uh, quinacridone red. But but I I rarely more, go more go more than two colors, two uh, two yellows, two reds, and two blues. And and help people understand the warm and cool of that. Um, why you want to have a warm and a cool version of each? Well, basically, what you if you um, if you kind of visualize a, a, a color wheel, 
And like you have pure, pure textbook yellow, pure textbook red, pure textbook blue. It has three equidistant points on the circle. Then you, what, what, like in, let's say your yellows, you want one yellow that's uh, on the uh, orange side of, of the wheel and one yellow that's on the blue side of the wheel. And the reason being is, is to, uh, co it covers your bases. It makes mixing all the colors easier. Like you don't need two blues that are both warm or you don't need two yellows that are both cool. So you, you try to, what I try to do in my palette is get, get one a warm and a cool on each side of like pure red, pure yellow, pure blue. So that kind of gives you the, uh, a good uh, opportunity to, uh, you know, to cover the, your bases on all colors in nature. And then the, there's other reasons too. Then I'll pick out, I'll use a chance, I'll make sure I have a few transparent colors, a few semi-opaque colors because they act a little different. So there, you know, there's reasons. Sometimes I'll use a color like cerulean blue because it's a middle value in itself. So, like if I'm painting a night scene, it'll that will, can be used similar in a similar way to white in the sense that it uh, lightens the color without putting white into it. So there's a lot of reasons for choosing different colors, but the bottom line is uh, is limit. I limit my palette, and I try for the most part to get uh, a warm and a cool of each primary. Well, I'll tell you, I'm one of those guys that every time I walk into an art store and I see a new color, I buy it, and then I screw everything <laughs> up. But the art, you're you're the, the one uh, that Winston Newton lives for. Oh, yeah, they love people like me, and you know, I've got a thousand tubes of paint in my studio that I never use. I always come back to the same colors, but the, um, uh, you know, the color harmony that you get using essentially three colors in white is uh, unlike any other color harmony. You don't have to try as much. You don't have to use as many... Um, techniques to create that sense of warm and cool, but there are techniques that do get employed. Can you talk a little bit about those techniques? Uh, techniques per what? Was that well, uh, in terms of um, how to, how to how to place color. For instance, some artists will say, "Okay, uh, I want to have a complementary color next to a, you know another color." For instance, a a purple next to a yellow, or I want to have a cool next to a warm. Do you have uh, any techniques like that that you typically employ? Uh, what I usually do is, I, I, in my color, like I'll, I usually do a day on color, on color uh, theory, color mixing, and color harmony. I, I try to bring students back to the, the original metaphor of a uh, of a refracted light combi combining the pure refracted light combining to make all the other colors. And it's like when you understand that, when you understand the the implication of that, you don't have to tell anybody to put a warm into your cool colors or cool into your warm because that's what nature does. And you, you can see it after after considering the idea. So I usually just try to bring them back to that point of seeing, uh, is trying to understand that what what's making up the color that you see. Like if you see a green tree in sunlight, it's um, it's going to be the it's what makes up that color are the, are the uh, first colors of the rainbow, and then you you think back to your put that into your palette, which is pretty close when you limit limit your palette, and then kind of go from there. A lot of the stuff that you learn in art school is uh, it's right, but now you know why it's right. Did you go to art school? I went to the American Academy in Chicago for a few years. Oh, great school. Yeah, I was I was about about eight or nine years after Richard Schmidt was there. Huh. So, uh, and and do you feel like the the training you got there is training that you're still applying today, or is it? Or did you have to kind of relearn? Um, in, in a sense, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't a very good student as far as like being in a dark room, you know, with you no know, winter. I was, I was just all anxious to get outside and do things different, but, uh, but yeah, I learned a lot of good stuff. It's, it's a great school. It was inspiring to be around some of the students. And, uh, so it was, it was a good experience all in all. Well, this has been terrific. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about mentors. You mentioned, um, someone earlier, um, who was it, Bill? Uh, Millard Sheets. Oh, Millard. That's right. So you mentioned Millard Sheets earlier. Uh, and you mentioned some some principles that you learned from him. Is is there um, anything else that he might have shared with you now that he's gone, or is there um, is there someone else that maybe has passed that you learned from, who 
whose information you could push forward by getting us some of what they taught you? The, as I look back, uh, my I have really two mentors that really took an interest in me and helped me in, in, in a way that was kind of above and beyond. And that was, uh, Mill, Millard was one. And that Millard would have been in like the, uh, probably the 70s. And the other was uh, the watercolorist Robert E. Wood. Not the oil painter Robert Wood, but the uh, the watercolorist Robert E. Wood. And uh, both, both of them, I think it was more, I was young and impressionable. I was in my early 20s. And just being around, they were both like a force of nature, you know, with these accomplished artists. And the Miller Sheets was was elderly even then. Uh, but and he, uh, uh, Miller took an interest in me, invited me to the studio a few times. Uh, I have an interesting little anecdote. Miller uh, had just come back from uh, a trip to Africa. And he invited me to, I went up to Gualala, up north of Mendocino. And just to visit him, and uh, I was dying to see his sketchbooks. That was the one thing I, because he had just come back from this trip, so I asked him if I could, you know, look through his sketchbooks. And so sure, so he gives me a sketchbook, and and I start going through it, and there's they're not, and there's not, they're not even drawings. <laughs> it's just information. It's like little little half sketches, and then a paragraph written, and something else. And it was like I was like astounded. I mean, this, like the information that he collected was so totally. He, he told me that basically it was, uh, he believed that uh, creativity came from memory more than it came from uh, actual, he said pho- He said he never shot photographs and that uh, a photograph would actually be an impediment. And so what, what he did was he would collect information, like he would do sketches and like a, if there was a pattern of a rug or a village or some, you know, African th- thing. But basically it was just he collecting this information and uh, it was amazing. I was Never forget that. Reminds me of, of um, George Carlson. George does very limited sketches, but he'll he'll draw little lines and say, you know, that was blue or that was red or this was orange. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, That's know. what Miller's sketches were like. He'd have, he'd have little notations, you know, color, you know, shorthands and, and little sketches. I mean, to call them a sketch is like being, you know. Generous. Generous. I mean, <laughs> But it was, I learned so much. It was like he had two or three sketchbooks. He was in Africa, like I think two or three weeks. Well, so you're you're doing some mentoring. It sounds like you're doing teaching and workshops. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, I'm doing uh, I'm doing a couple of classes. I've I've slowed that slowed down a bit. Um, I'm not doing as many as I did at one time. But uh, I have a I have a uh, watercolor workshop in Boise in uh, June. It, these are all on my website. If anybody's interested, and then I have a uh, oil plein air oil class at uh, in northern Wisconsin in uh, September. Now that's my thirteenth year of teaching up there. And your uh, website is franklalumia.com. dot com. So L A L U M I A, franklalumia dot com. So that'd be a great right. place to check those out. Uh, well, Frank, this has been a pleasure. What questions do you have for me? I'm just, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, th- you you have uh, you've enlightened us a lot today. You've given us a lot of insights into painting. A lot of people who are uh, discovering plein air painting for the first time and trying to figure it all out. And you've really simplified things. I would encourage people to go to your website, check out your workshops, uh, see if you can find this beautiful book online. It's called Plein Air Painting in Watercolor and Oil paint from life successfully uh it's probably on ebay or something uh but it's it's fabulous it's really good guide it helped me a lot when you first sent this to me many years ago oh thanks eric it's good terrific and i appreciate your time today frank you bet thanks for asking well again thanks to frank la lumia frank and i met gosh a long time ago and he's just a rock star painter and so i'm very honored to have him on the show The podcast, a reminder, was sponsored by the Plein Air Convention in Santa Fe. This week, you can learn more at pleinairconvention.com. It's also uh, by the Publishers Invitational Art Camp in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York in June. We have a lot of fun. You should join us. Uh, Check it out at publishersinvitational.com. And also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about just stuff, Sometimes life, sometimes art, sometimes philosophy. 
Uh, it's up to 100,000 readers now. So check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. And you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. You can subscribe to that so it shows up every Sunday morning when I'm up early writing those things. The plein air movement is red hot, which may be why plein air magazine continues to be the top-selling representational art magazine sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. Drop by, pick one up. Or better yet, just pick up a subscription by going to plenairmagazine.com. You know, I always love doing this. It's fun. I'm excited. Oh, I'm so excited about seeing everybody at the plein air convention. What a blast we're going to have. I hope to see you there, and I hope to see you back here next week, uh, and we'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Oh, and by the way, my new book is coming out, and it's about how to make money selling your art. And so that's coming out at the Plein Air Convention. We'll tell you more about that sometime in the future. Remember, it's a great big world out there, and go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.